Hey church, I hope you had a great week this last week. Yeah. We were so excited to see many of you join us last Sunday for our Father's Day barbecue. Yeah, It awesome. was an awesome time. We um, gathered in the church car park and we are actually going to be gathering again next Sunday, mm -hmm. um, July 5th for Communion Sunday at 5 p.m. Yeah. Um, in the church car park again, we're going to have yeah. Fellowship. Fellowship. And... We're going to have a time of worship. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, we have had two in-person gatherings yes. so far with Father's Day and mm -hmm. before that, Pentecost Sunday. Both have been in the car park. That's yeah. the Australian way to say yes. parking lot. Parking lot. Um, Sorry, car park. And so parking lot, car park, whatever. Yeah. And uh, they have been good events, good experiences right. as we have been you know, navigating uh, what in-person gatherings look like. Yeah. And so what we're going to do is we're basically going to combine the two. We're going to have a worship time that we had like on Pentecost Sunday. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to have a time of fellowship and breaking bread, AKA barbecue, getting the grills out. Right. And so um, we're going to be doing that next week and yeah. super excited. I yeah. uh, just want to um, reassure everyone that this will be a safe and responsible event, uh, mm -hmm. practicing social distancing, uh, providing a space where social distancing can yeah, be achieved. achieved. Yep. Um, and we've decided to meet outdoors rather than indoors this week and at this point because mm -hmm. it just is a safer option yeah. for us. And plus the weather is cooperating finally. Right. So um, we would love to see you next week mm -hmm. at um, five o'clock. p.m., yeah. So after 4th of July. Right. You know, Celebrate. activities, mm -hmm. um, five, five o'clock here for a time of worship and prayer, communion, breaking bread afterwards and seeing one another. Right. And this week we conclude our collective series mm -hmm. with a special guest and friend, Steve Zakawani. Yes. Um, but before we hear him, which we're really excited to do, let's enter into a time of worship together.
and girls, it's The Choice Is Yours! And here's your host, Alyssa! Woo! Welcome to the show today. I am so glad you're here and have we got a show for you. So, mysterious announcer voice. My name is Fred. Oh, <laughs> I forgot. Silly me. Mysterious announcer voice, Fred. <sighs> Who is our lucky contestant today? Today we have not one but two amazing contestants. Please welcome seven-year-olds, Valentine and Eden. Two of you, wow. Um, wow, we've never had two contestants at a time on this show before. I am so confused. Why are you both here? We came together. Oh. Together we are gonna win this game. Ha ha, I gotcha, together we. Well played, well I can't argue with that. One host, two contestants, it's on. This is gonna be fun. So today our topic is faith. And if you answer all three questions correctly, you win. What do we win? Oh, <laughs> actually I've never been asked that question before. Um, mysterious announcer voice, Fred, tell the contestants what they'll win. They win the game. <laughs> Hmm. And confetti! Okay, confetti. For all the confetti, here is question number one. It's Sunday morning in Kingdom Kids, and there you are, happily snacking away on your goldfish crackers without a care in the world. You're listening to your teacher teach about faith, when suddenly she turns, she looks at you, and she asks you what faith is. What do you say? Number one, faith is something only grown-ups have. Number two, faith is believing that God will do what he says. Or number three, can I please use the bathroom? What do you choose? Not number three, that's a little awkward. Fair point. Number two. Right you are, number two, because faith is believing that God will do what he says. On to question number two. Before you, there are three boxes. Now each box has an item in it, and one of these items has something to do with faith. Can you choose the correct item? The choice is yours. Ooh, slime. Interesting. Hmm. Harry, what's he doing in here? Oh, Harry, uh, he must be napping. We better just uh, let him rest. Yellow mustard seeds. There's a verse about this in the Bible. I'll go with yellow mustard seeds. Right you are, mustard seeds. In the Bible, Jesus tells about faith and that faith as small as a mustard seed is powerful enough to move mountains. You got it right. Nice job, guys. You've made it to the final round. In the final round, I have one more question for you. If you choose the right answer, you win all the confetti. My faith grows when I, number one, trust God to take care of me, number two, give my problem to God, trusting him for the answer, 
Or number three, read the Bible and learn his promises for me. What do you choose? Is this a trick? There are all of them. Oh, you got me. I was trying to be a little sneaky. The correct answer is all of the above. All of those are different ways that we grow in faith. Congratulations, guys, you won it all. Woo! Oh my goodness, it's amazing. There you have it, folks. They've gone three for three again. And a note to our viewers, if you are interested in being a future contestant on The Choice is Yours, just contact us and let us know. But one more thing, you do have to be, you know, a kid. Join us next time on The Choice is Yours. Now I'm gonna go join the cleanup crew. In the Bible, there were a lot of different people who showed us what faith looks like. Like Abraham, God gave him a promise when he was 99 years old. Woo, that's pretty old. Right? And God promised him this, that he would be the father of many nations. Well, when God made Abraham this promise, he didn't have any children. And so as impossible as this promise seemed, Abraham chose to believe God, and God fulfilled that promise and indeed made him a father and a father of many nations for generations. Yeah, that took a lot of faith, and God showed himself faithful to Abraham. Mm -hmm. And another really cool thing about our faith is that it's meant to grow. In the Bible, when he was on earth, yeah. Jesus compared faith to a mustard seed. And this is a tiny, this is a mustard seed. Oh my Isn't that tiny, tiny? And Jesus said that if you even had faith the size of a mustard seed, mountains could be moved by it. That's how powerful faith is because that's how powerful God is. Wow. And you know what seeds do, right? They grow. Mustard seeds can grow into trees that are 20 feet tall from that seed. Yeah, and it's okay to start small, like this seed, with your own faith. You can practice your faith day by day, moment by moment, by saying, God, I choose to trust you today. God, I choose to give this worry to you today. God, I know that you have a good plan for me, and I believe that today. And as we do that, we see our faith grow and God does pretty amazing things with it. That's right. The more we do that, the more our faith grows. And time after time, we see God do exactly what he promised because God always keeps his word. So let's keep growing in our faith. One promise at a time and one hard thing at a time. Let's choose to believe that God will do what he says. Yes. Because nothing is impossible with God. And wherever you are at today, he is right there with you. Have a great week, Kingdom Kids. We'll see you soon. Bye. Well, hey, church, this month we've been having uh, wonderful spirit-led conversations as part of our collective series. And today we conclude that. And I really pray that it's been a blessing to you. It's been so nice to hear from friends that we have of my church and get a broader perspective, a kingdom perspective on the collective of Jesus, which is the church. And today we conclude that series uh, with a very special guest that I'm excited to introduce you to, um, well known in the sports world as 2009 first draft pick, not second, not third, first draft pick and former Seattle Sounders star number 11, Steve. So wonderful to have you here. Thanks for being here. I'm glad to be here. It feels like um, my second home sometimes, so I'm glad to be here. Oh, well, you, you know, you really should make it your first home. I mean, <laughs> you're, you're still in that broader Seattle area, and I, I'm hearing a lot of people are moving out of Seattle these days. They are, they are. Yeah. So uh, let, me, let, me, let me pray on it. Let me yeah, think about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Bellingham. Um, yeah, how is the Emerald City these days anyway? Everything's good. Obviously, the time we're in, um, we're all adjusting to it. So I, I'm, I live in the sports world, and the sports world got shut down from the NBA, um, MLS, everybody shut down. I think now they're slowly reopening. Yeah. But in Seattle specifically, we're quite a ways away from being back to normal. So um, yeah. we're, we're all sitting back and just watching what's happening. Yeah, my goodness. Yeah, we're all, well, we're all watching. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, yeah, you know, um, before we get into some current events, I wanted yeah. to just uh, touch on a few things about you. Yeah. Um, you uh, have come out with a book, yeah. 500 Days, yeah. which is um, a, a story and really a testimony of injury to coming back and playing 
uh, Major yeah. League Soccer, and then yeah. just recently, last year, uh, a video documentary yeah. on Breakable, yeah. which is incredible, yeah. by the way. Thank you. And so, you. Uh, that's that's can I can I viewed it on Amazon, but what yeah. platforms is that? On? Yeah. So Unbreakable is a documentary which. Um, it's doing really well right now because everyone's at home. Yeah, so everyone has to be home, so they have to find something. They're to looking watch. for content. So, yeah, so sports docs are doing well. Um, that one's on Amazon Prime, so you yeah. can Unbreakable. I think the full official title is Unbreakable: The Steve Zakwani Story. I think that's what they gave it. Yeah. But um, that's on Amazon Prime, and in the book you referenced, um, Five Hundred Days is is also available on Amazon. Yeah. So, um, or any bookstore, pretty much. And it also goes by the name Rise Above. Yeah. And the documentary is my sports career. The book is everything. It deals with my faith journey, uh, my upbringing, um, everything to where I am now, to the point the book was written. So yeah. both go hand in hand well. I can't recommend one over the other because I want people um, to experience both. Yeah. yeah. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. So there's so there's the last dance. Yeah. And then there's unbreakable. <laughs> so you're, side by side. Right, right side by side. Yeah. <laughs> Me and Michael Jordan. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. No. <laughs> But people are hungry for content, and that's really a really powerful yeah. documentary. And so, um, for it, you know, I was going to encourage anyone to to watch that. Uh, you can get it on Amazon or yeah. or whatnot. Um, but for those that haven't, would love to hear like you've got a powerful testimony of perseverance, yeah. and would love to hear just um, you know just in part. Um, a little bit about your background yeah. and, and how you came to where you are right now today, if that's yeah. okay. Yeah, so I mean, I've been um, all over the world. I've been in the United States now for 13 years. Before that, I was 14 years in London. My journey began um, in Africa, in a country called the Congo. Um, I was number three of my parents' six children. Yeah, wow. And then wow. when I was age four, we moved to London. So my mom's side of the family um, were Catholic. My dad's side of the family were Muslim background. So I grew up in a house with both. Um, so especially my grandparents um, on my dad's side um, were very strong Muslims. So I had both. We got to London, and I think when I was around age five or six, both my parents became born again Christians. So wow. by age seven, I was exposed to three very different um, spiritual perspectives. Our house became the church house. So Sunday, we were going to be in church. Monday, prayer meeting. Tuesday, choir meeting. Wednesday, Bible study. For, Every night of the week, something church was happening. So I was very involved from a very young age. I got to about age 12, 13, and I was like, yeah, this isn't working for me. There's nothing here. Mm. I don't feel, you know, I pray and it bounces off the ceiling and comes back and nothing's really happening here. So from between age 13, I would say to age 17, I never touched the Bible. I never prayed. I never, I essentially walked away from it. Um, as a young kid, it was because it was my parents' faith. It wasn't mine. Yeah. So... Age 16 was an um, interesting time in my life. It was the same year where um, I pretty much I'd finished school, but I was supposed to sign a professional sports contract, soccer contract. But I had a wonderful idea, me and four of my friends, to steal a motorcycle and crash the motorcycle and get an injury, which prevented me from signing that contract. Mm -hmm. And so now I left school with no qualifications. I didn't sign a professional contract. I was rock bottom. Yeah. The only person in that time that reached out to me was a sports teacher that I had, uh, Mr. Paul Goodison, was a Jamaican sports teacher. And he called me up on Saturday night and he goes, what are you doing tomorrow, Sunday? And listen, my Sundays were sleep in, wake up, watch soccer, sleep again. And he goes, I'm gonna take you to a business leadership seminar. And I had no idea what was a business leadership seminar. This was 2005, I was 17. He picks me up Sunday morning about nine o'clock. I lived in North London, we drive to the east side of the city. We walk in there, it's like a warehouse, and we go in, and I get so upset because I realize we're inside a church. You've been tricked. I've been tricked. You, this guy, <laughs> you, you got me. And I see choir, and I see all kinds of stuff. And I remember sitting there and saying to myself, and this was June 12, 2005, I'll never forget, I'm going to, church is about two hours from what I recall. I'm going to let the time pass. I'm going to play games on my phone. This was the old phones. The games weren't that good. Um, so yeah. The old Nokia phones we had in <laughs> London. Um, I'm going to play games on my phone, text my friends, let the time pass. I don't want to be hearing this. So... The pastor gets up, makes a few announcements, introduces a guest speaker. The guest speaker gets up. There's maybe um, about, I don't know, a thousand people in the church. I don't know. But the guest speaker begins to speak, and it felt like it was just me and him in the room. Hmm. Things he was saying, I'm like, there's no way you could know that about my life. Wow. How is this possible? They then said, if today's your first day in this church, the speaker has a brand new book, you get a free copy. So when the service finished, I was the first one in line. And when they pulled back the... 
The barrier, I walked up, he was sitting there, his wife and daughter on either side of him. And he signed the book and I shook his hand. And to this day, I tell all my people that I speak to, when I looked in his eyes, I saw what I can only describe as peace. And mm. I'd never seen peace before. I've never seen peace since. Wow. And I whispered to myself and to God, who had no concept of God at the time, I said, I want what this man has. That was it. I went home that night and I was laying in bed. I'll never forget this. It was like probably 10 p.m., 11 p.m. And I began thinking about my day and being in church and I began to get emotional. Hmm. And I was wiping away the tears as fast as I can. The more I wiped, the more I cried. <laughs> so I phoned my teacher, my sports teacher. And I said to him, I don't know what you guys did to me at church today, but make it stop. Like, I don't know what's happening, but I shouldn't be crying like that. And then he talked me through it, calmed me down a little bit. And then my room in the house was at the very bottom, um, bottom floor of the house, corner of the house. And there was a Bible in the room. And I picked the Bible up and I began to read the Bible. And that became, began a journey with reading the Bible. I probably spent six weeks nonstop. That was all I did. Nobody mm. saw me. I never went out. And it began to inform my vision. And I began to um, recapture my passion for playing soccer. And the person I became, I bought so many books on Amazon. and watched a ton of YouTube videos. I began to attend church. And my life began to turn around. And the vision essentially that I got was I'd become a professional soccer player. And I would use that platform um, to, 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 to change the world. And that's what, mm. it was a very difficult path to get there. But my faith essentially was established in that six week period in my house, by myself, no cameras, no one there. Um, reading, arguing with God, we had a lot of arguments, a lot of arguments with God where I said, you know, you have to make this happen. And then I would hear confirmation, I'd go out and it wouldn't work. And I'd come back and we'd debate some more, some more. But um, ultimately God was faithful to his word, I left home in London, went to Ohio to play college, soccer, spent two years. My sophomore year was the leading player in the country and then was mm -hmm. drafted by Seattle, um, came here, had a fantastic career with the Sounders and you know, the rest is history. Yeah, wow. And then and, and, uh, part of your testimony is, is really being at the peak yeah. of your career, getting an injury yeah. inflicted by someone else other yeah. than you. Yeah. And then this journey of, of forgiveness and, and yeah. recovery. And, uh, you know, as you say, like you've been wrestling with God, like I see this, this dream that the Lord gave you yeah. at the beginning, this vision and uh, this, this unique journey that you're on that some of us find, find ourselves in when we submit right. fully to God, it's right. like, hold right. on, oh yeah, plot twists coming. Oh, and, yeah. Uh, um, yeah. and so we're, uh, we're still in the Steve Zakawani journey right now Yes. from what I see, which is really exciting. I think as your, as your friend now, it's like seeing what you're coming out with, seeing, seeing this faith narrative, Yeah. you know, the, the rest of the world, they may not see that right now, right. but some of us that know, like we see this faith narrative, um, which yeah. uh, ultimately you're saying, well, London is, is a destination that you'd like to see yeah. with kingdom hope yeah. and, yeah. and dreams that you've been given. Yeah. Yeah, I think my ultimate work will be um, amongst my people in London. That mm. was the dream I had at age 17. So at age 17, I still have the notebook at home in my office. I wrote down my life, age yeah. 17, everything I would do. I would play soccer, I would play in these stadiums, I would play around the world, um, I would speak to churches, to businesses, to universities, which I've done. I mm -hmm. would write books. I, would, I wrote all of this down with my vision. I submitted it to God. I re remember reading the Bible in my young, young faith. Um, of about Abraham making a deal with God and Abraham telling God, what if there's 50 Rachel? And I said, I, I like that. Let me make a deal with God too. And I said to yeah. God, if you make me a pro soccer player, I will preach the gospel. I remember writing that probably age 17, 18. And I wrote it down and I signed it to make it official. <laughs> and I showed God and I said, okay. And then I left home for the next six months or so going to different trials, mm -hmm. trying to get a professional contract. And every team said no. So after six months, I came back home took out that piece of paper, turned the light on as if God needs the light to see. And I showed God like what happened. I'll never forget this. And I was so disappointed. And not long after I was reading in scripture, um, a couple of verses in Deuteronomy and one that said, um, God is a faithful God who keeps covenant with those who love him up to a thousand years. Mm. And I said, okay, well, mine's only been six months. I guess I've got a little bit more time. So that was kind of my faith journey at the time where I was just so brazen and so bold and believing God. But each step of the way, 
um, God had to remind me that he does things in his own time, in his own way. Yeah. One of the promises of Jesus, I think that um, we, we should claim his promises. There's one promise we don't like to claim, and he promised it to all of us. He says, right before he left to return to his father, he says, in this world, you will have trouble. Yeah. He never said you might. He says, you will have trouble. That's a promise. Yep. And we, I, I don't like that one too much, but it's right there. I, yeah. <laughs> in this world, you will have trouble, but you have to keep reading. Have courage, have overcome the world. Come on. That one has always encouraged me. I remember when he was speaking to the disciples and he says to Peter, Simon, Simon, the devil has desired to sift all you guys like wheat. In other words, he's gonna rip you apart. He goes, but fear not, I have prayed for you. I always found that verse fascinating because I always pray to God. This is now God in the flesh telling me he prayed for me. Yeah. So if God's gonna pray for a human, I wonder what he's gonna pray for. Yeah. Because when I pray to God, I take my whole shopping list, I tell God I want this, this, that. What would God pray for human about? He goes, courage, I have prayed for you. And he says to him, I've prayed that your faith will not fail. Yeah. That you won't lose your faith. Essentially, I don't mind if you lose everything, as long as you don't yeah. lose your faith. Yes. So yeah. you might lose your house, you might lose your car, you might lose your ministry, you might lose your health. You might lose everything. The only thing I prayed for is you don't lose your faith. Yeah. Because once that's gone, now it's over. So that is, I think that's in Luke 22, 31. And that is the thing that I've always sort of held on to. Yeah. So when I had my injury, for example, which is still regarded the worst injury in Major League Soccer history, it was a tough time because I was living right, doing everything right. At the peak of my powers, it's very hard to be a soccer player, very hard to be a top-level athlete. I was one of the stars on the team. I was going places. Yeah. And then injury. Yeah. Stops. God, where are you? So you go through that, and I realized I lost everything. And the statement I came away with from that time in my life that has kept me was one of my mentors said to me, he says, you cannot let this kind of injury destroy your faith because if your faith was only as strong as the health of your right leg, that's not faith. That's convenience. Wow. That's convenience. Faith in God has to be faith no matter what. Yeah. So I decided then, I said, all right, I just believe. I yeah. don't know what's gonna happen. I don't know what I'm gonna get, what I'm gonna lose. I really don't know. No matter what, I'm just gonna believe. And I think that's in this particular time, it's the faith you need. With a pandemic, we have social unrest, we have high levels of unemployment, all kinds of stuff. People are losing everything. Yeah. And we don't have to guess what Christ is interceding about on our behalf. He told us, I pray you will not lose your faith. That's wow. It. Yeah. Well, that I'm so glad you said that because, um, you know, with everything that's been happening right now, I've been thinking about your testimony, <laughs> yeah. especially like, you know, we, we share a mutual friend, David yes. Myers, and yes. uh, I'm like, I want Steve to come speak to the church. <laughs> and um, knowing the testing that you have been through, things yeah. that have been taken away yeah. from you, yeah. and you're saying, well, faith is the principal thing. Yeah. Um, whether your job's been taken away, whether some of you feel like some of your freedoms have been taken away, yeah. whether um, for us, whether some of our events and services, church that as we have known it has been taken away, yeah. uh, maintaining the faith. Yeah. Um, I can relate to that personally, yeah. where I'm like, where is my faith? <laughs> yeah. I've got to... I've got to contend for it. I've got to be, I'm, I'm praying in the morning. I'm in yeah. my word more. I'm, I'm finding all these things. And, exactly. And so um, what a relevant message right now yeah. uh, that we're all going through yeah. that Jesus prophesied would happen. Would happen. You would have um, trouble. Which is messing with, with many theologies oh, of yeah. things, you know, no, are going to get better. You know. Everything's going to be rosy. No, no, no. Yeah. The one thing he promised was persecution. Um, but there's good news, as always, with God. God doesn't leave us um, just mm -hmm. there. Um, another verse that has always helped me, there's a few cornerstone verses in my life. My favorite book of the Bible is Ecclesiastes, mm -hmm. um, just because it's so wild and just, oh my God, what a journey this is. I love that yeah. book. Um, chapter three, to everything there is a season. There's a time to laugh, a time to cry, a time, all these kinds of things. But that first sentence, to all things there is a season. A season is th the best concept of life. Seasons are not permanent. Mm -hmm. Seasons never last. Mm -hmm. Seasons always change. Yeah. So right now, we're in a season. Yeah. But the good news is, 
it cannot last. Yeah. And we have to know that. For example, every year, there's spring, summer, fall, winter. Mm -hmm. No matter how bad of a winter you have, it doesn't matter. You always know spring is going to come. Yep. No matter how bad the winter is. So when winter comes, you don't throw away all your summer clothes and your bathing suits and your shorts. And you don't throw that yep. away, your flip-flops. You still have it there because you know at some point this is going to turn around. Yeah. And when the summer's there, don't be naive to think it's going to be sunshine all the time yeah. at some point. So the scripture is very clear. To everything, there's only a season. Yeah. This is why I believe God gives us vision. Yeah. Vision is, and this is one of God's greatest gifts and also one of the biggest source of frustration for humans. Because God will meet you where you are, show you the end at the beginning, and tell you, I'm gonna take you there. Yeah. And we get so excited, because that, oh my God, that's what, that's what my church is gonna look like, that's what my family's gonna look like, that's how I'm gonna look, this is a, that's what I'm gonna accomplish, God, this is amazing, let's go do it now. Yeah. I said, okay, no problem, let's start at the beginning. Yeah. And on the way, there's going to be persecution, there's going to be pitfalls, there's going to be loss, and even disillusionment with God. But God, didn't you say? Yeah. So I think of David and Joseph mm. and Moses. And if you take any of them, you take Joseph, for example, God says to him, look, you're going to go to Egypt, you're going to be alongside Pharaoh, you're going to rule over your brothers. And Joseph says, God, this is amazing. You know? So God says, okay, but slow down, Joe. Let's, let's take you through the path. Yeah. He eventually has jealous siblings who sell him into, um, into bondage. And at one point, he actually ends up physically in a pit. Yeah. And I always think what Joseph must have wondered being in that pit. But God, didn't you show me sitting in the seat of power? And the statement I always take from that is, Joseph's looking around and all he sees is the pit. But he can take heart because he knows that's not what God showed me. So if what you see is not what you saw, then what you see has to be temporary. Mm. The pit has to be temporary. Yeah. So right now, the whole globe, the church, businesses, sports, we're all in the pit. Yeah. But we know that what we see is not what God showed us. Yeah. So what we're seeing has to be temporary. So our faith is tied not to the circumstance, but to the ultimate vision. Yeah. Which is to everything, there's a season. So right now, it's just a season. So I tell everybody, relax. Mm -hmm. Be calm, be cool. This is why Jesus could be in a storm on a ship and sleep. Yeah. Because he understood. He knew the vision was that he's going to be going to Jerusalem. He'd be crucified. He'd resurrect and go up in glory. He knew that was coming. Yeah. So when there's a storm and everybody's panicking, he, he's fast asleep. Yeah. That, that, that is the kind of faith level we have to aspire to arrive to. So I believe the reason God gives us vision is to weather the storms. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't have a vision beyond your storm, it's over. Yeah. And I finished that point with this quote. The person that cannot see the ultimate will always be a slave to the immediate. Yeah. That means whatever's immediately happening is going to enslave you. Yeah. But if you have an ultimate vision, Come on. you can live beyond the immediate circumstances. Yeah. And that's where we have to live if we have any hope of making it out of this current crisis, yeah. global crisis. Oh, that's so good. Um, and vision is like <laughs> what we're desperate for right now. Yeah. Now, I... I, I agree with that 100%. And, and right now, personally, you know, for our church and, and even for our nation, like yeah. um, we can't lose vision, what God has called us to be. Um, but would you say that vision is clarified in the journey? You know, I, I feel like God has given me words or a vision, yeah. but it's a little more a broad stroke. And then um, just in my own humanity and in patience, I'll start putting details on that vision and, uh, <laughs> and all of a sudden something happens that's, Hey, that's not going to work anymore, but the vision still remains, but God, can you clarify that vision yeah. for Joseph? Yeah. Um, I saw this taking place, yeah. you know, maybe I thought the fulfillment of my vision was in Potiphar's house. I mean, I was, yeah. I was working under a, exactly. a powerful man. Now I'm in prison. And, um, and I, I relate to the pit right now. I relate to the prison <laughs> yeah. where it's like, okay, the vision remains, but, but clarify what is, I, I thought Potiphar's house was it, yeah. the pinnacle. Yeah. Like I thought that was the, the path I'm on and where Joseph didn't know, Hey, you're about to get launched into the palace yeah. and to rule hmm. right alongside Pharaoh. And so, um, right now the clarification I'm, I'm submitting to the process of Lord bring clarification to the vision. Don't yeah. lose sight of the vision. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, yeah. Steve, last year you 
you preached a powerful message to our church, and yeah, uh, which was uh, what we were saying, like the sixth or seventh time you've I think come so. To speak. I've, been, I've been coming here for years, and I love it every time. And, yeah. and I always love it because we've, you know, we've grown a lot. We've gotten every time you come. There's a there's a uh, a large percentage of people that have not heard you speak yes, before. Yes. And so, yeah. um, so <laughs> you know, and I love it too because you're a, a world class athlete. Yeah. And so there is sometimes an expectation. Oh, we're going to hear sports stories. Yeah. And uh, but you're a high level intellectual as well. And yes. so people will, you know, I'll I'll get the responses. Oh my God, I was not expecting that from a soccer player or yeah, a baseball it, player. It happens all the time. And I, I, yeah. and I love, I wait, I anticipate that response. <laughs> yeah. um, and so, but last last, last year when you preached, um, of course, all was seemingly well in the world. Mm -hmm. And then now you're here yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and it's completely different. And um, I, I'd love for you to speak even more to the individual like you, like you were as far mm -hmm. as vision and just, um, and really how to deal with cultural issues yeah. um, as a Christian. Um, because when I think about John 15 and 17, where Jesus says, being in the world, but not of the world, yeah. you're a name that comes yeah. to mind yeah. at the top but, of the list. Yeah. Uh, you are embedded in the culture yeah. and one of the most influential industries, yeah. uh, the American sports industry. Yeah. And uh, you've stood out. I love that you said that you signed that contract with the Lord. You stood out as... Um, someone that is leading. Um, I know that athletes come to you. I know that others yeah. come to you and look at, to you for leadership and perspective. Yeah. Um, and so would love for you to speak into a cultural time mm -hmm. um, because we're, we're, you know, we've been pushed out of the four walls. Oh, yeah. Thank God we, that the church has finally left the building yeah. and we're out in the culture dealing with real cultural issues yeah. right now. And it's like, man, this faith has to work. Yeah, I can't exactly. get lost. I can't get sidetracked or pitfalled by everything that's coming against uh, us as a Christians right now. But how can we thrive as Christians, mm -hmm. as, as people in the kingdom of God, in the culture right now, which yeah. we're being forced and pushed out into? Yeah, th th there's many interesting things that Jesus did in his life. So, no, every year, um, for as long as I can remember, I try to go through at least the four Gospels every year, sometimes mm -hmm. a couple times a year. Always can find new things in what Jesus said and how he said, and also what he didn't say. Yeah. So something I always uh -huh. found interesting. When Jesus speaks many times, you know, he always would tell us where he was from. But he would never say, you know, I'm from Nazareth, grew up in Bethlehem, hang out in Galilee with my friends, me and Simon go to Judea. No, he never said that. He always would claim I am from above, not from below. Yeah. I came down from my father. I am not of this world. He always reminded us, for some reason, that his true heritage was heaven, yeah. not uh -huh. earth. I live here, I operate here, but my source is not here. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what he was trying to tell us when he says, be in the world system, but don't be of yeah. the world system. Mm -hmm. If you are in the world, the world, the word world, he used the word cosmos, which just means systems. It doesn't really mean the earth. Earth yeah. is a different word. So the business world, sports world, political world, banking world, all these are just systems. He goes, be in there, don't be of there. Here's why. If you are from there, then all your solutions have to come from there. Yep. And listen, wow. if there's one thing we're realizing right now is that all these systems ain't yeah. as strong as before. Come on. Everything's collapsing. Yeah. The only people that are going to survive are the ones whose faith is in a, and solution is in a different system. Yeah, come on. That's, That's good. why when Jesus was face to face with Pilate, the most powerful man in his region, when Pilate says, don't you know I've got the power to kill you? Christ almost laughed. I'm, I'm sure he laughed inside. He smiled. He yeah. goes, you have no power over me except it was given you yeah. by my government in heaven, my father in heaven. He goes, Furthermore, I lay down my life. No man takes it from me. Mm. You can only speak with such authority when you know you don't belong here. Mm. So I try to wake up every single day knowing, okay, I'm a heavenly being, a spiritual being, having an earthly experience. That's it. So everything I'm seeing here, this ain't where I'm really from. So you always have a chance to get solutions from heaven that can impact earth. If you limit yourself to earth, you're going to be in problems. Wow. Now, the one word that I've been feeling during this time that we don't really talk about is the word innovation. And even the meaning of what we mean by that, innovation essentially is doing old things in new ways. 
and the people that are going to innovate during this time are the ones who are going to make it through. For example, Jesus Christ heals four blind people, never repeats the process twice. He's too creative. First one comes, he goes, okay, you go, you know, dive in the pool over there. Next one comes, spits on the ground, mud, puts it. Next one, he just speaks it. Always, he's too creative. Yeah. He never repeated a miracle twice in scripture. Wow. And he accomplished the same things, but he was too creative. God expects innovation from human beings. This is why he never gave Adam a chair. He hid the chair inside the tree. Yeah, come on. And Adam had to go and find the chair inside the tree. I take Samson, for example. He's a strong guy who's been attacked by people. It's a fantastic story. And he says he, take, he took a donkey's jawbone, a donkey's jawbone, and Samson smote his enemies and he attacked them. And when he was done, he looked around and he goes, I've just killed all these Philistines with my jawbone. Now, if that was me and you and anyone else, we would say this jawbone is amazing. I'm gonna keep it, I'm gonna patent it, I'm gonna produce a thousand of them, I'm gonna put it online on eBay and Amazon, I'm gonna sell them, this is a proven military weapon, it's proven to kill Philistines, this is the, the jawbone turbo extreme, I mean, you keep coming up with models, yeah. <laughs> because this thing works. The next verse says, after Samson had finished killing the Philistines, he threw the jawbone away. That verse fascinates me. Yeah. Are we willing to throw away the thing that worked? Come on. Are we? Mm. Because Samson understood the anointing wasn't on the method. It was on him. Yeah. That's the key. Going to church every Sunday in person is a jawbone. Hmm. Having prayer meetings in church in person is a jawbone. And God is telling us now, are you willing to throw the jawbone away? Wow. But we hold on to... So what would happen was Samson would have passed the jawbone to his children and then they're, to their children and to their children, and then they'd have called it, it's a tradition. And the scripture says, the traditions of men make the word of God of no effect. Yeah, wow. That's the key. And we keep traditioning, passing it down. The way things work, this has always worked, and God's saying it's a new day. Yeah. The things that have always worked ain't gonna work no more. Yeah, come so on. who is gonna innovate? How would the church innovate? Yeah. What would the church do with it? <laughs> what, what will a Sunday service look like in 2025? Yeah. I, I wonder. So these are the things that are happening now, and it's the people that are going to be willing to throw away the jawbone, throw away the things that worked. It's not a bad the jawbone. It works. Sunday service meeting in person isn't bad. It's fantastic. Yeah. But God saying, are you willing to throw that away and trust that the anointing is still there? Yeah. That is the space we are all currently living in now. Yeah. And I say we take heart from Jesus, who showed in his earthly ministry he was way too creative. Many miracles, never repeated it twice, always differently. So that's where we are right now. Mm -hmm. And my encouragement to people will be, and I'm having to think this myself as well, is you've seen it in the corporate world, in the business world, you know, a lot of companies are moving to work from home. Um, everybody suddenly discovered what Zoom is and having Zoom meetings and all these kinds of stuff. Um, this is what God does when he's shifting the world. Mm -hmm. And it's those who are going to innovate. I repeat, he never gave Adam a chair. He expected Adam to go find the chair inside the tree. Yeah. And that right now, there's a bunch of trees. Who's gonna go and find what's inside them? Yeah. That's how, that's how God operates. Oh man, I love that. You know, which which can be an excruciating process. <laughs> yes, it can. <laughs> can be exciting. Um, you know, if you're if you're creatively thinking, you're looking at the possibilities. Yeah. Um, where I'm trying to hold on to the jawbone, I'm getting really frustrated. Yeah. Lord, what's a jawbone? Yeah. And yeah. what is a new innovation that you're wanting to step us into? I mean, that's where the this is where we need to be on our knees right now yeah. because we're not going to get innovation by just no. complaining, no. talking. You know, it's like it's got to be this vertical connection. Lord, um, what are you calling us to do? And for for the church, this has been frustrating. Yeah, um, I bet. Yeah, and. Uh, but yet there's been new innovations. Mm -hmm. And so uh, you talk about media. I mean, the, the message of the gospel is getting translated to homes yeah. and people's IP addresses that have yeah. never it's actually seen. had it before. We've seen salvations happening out of state. See? People yeah. call, say, hey, we, we, we tuned in. And so despite the frustrations, because we've enjoyed We've enjoyed meeting and we've enjoyed yeah. we enjoy hugging each other. Yeah. Okay, we, we, we are a, we are a church that just you know we, we embrace. Yeah. And so this is this the bizarrest thing that yeah. we we can't do so many of the things that we enjoy. Yeah. Um, but yet 
God is building his kingdom yeah. through innovation. Yeah. And uh, what's happening in the home right now with small little house churches taking place, yeah. gatherings. I mean, you've got to fight for your community and faith right now. Yes, it's do. not easy. It's not a, a, a service that's just going to be open and you get to come and it's going to be so mm. great. Like, you've got to fight for it. And right now we're fighting for community, we're fighting for connection and faith. And I love what you said about the government with Pilate, Jesus saying, yeah. you really don't have that power. Right now, so many people are feeling powerless, but they're not. No. There's a higher authority. A higher authority. And that's why I, we, we should look at whether it's unemployment, the pandemic, the social unrest, the racial issues, and speak to he said, you shall speak to this mountain, tell it go, and it shall do so. Yeah. Take Christ at His word. Um, the virus, you have no power over me except it will give to my Father in heaven. Anything I go through in life, I realize this thing will only affect me to the degree to which my kingdom in heaven has allowed. That's yeah. it. Yeah. You cannot do more than that. You have no power over me except, and I think we have to make sure we shift that. There's something you said earlier that I was thinking, you're talking about clarif clarity and vision, clarification. There's a verse in Proverbs that is very helpful. It says, many are the plans in a man's heart, mm -hmm. but it's the Lord's purpose that prevails. Yeah. So God has been very clear. There's two things at work in life. There's your plans and there's my purpose. Yeah. And I'm already telling you the outcome of the game. Yeah. Many are the plans in a man's heart, that's good, but it's the Lord's purpose that prevails. So you can stay busy doing your plans, but no matter what happens, it's the purpose that's going to win. On. So a smart person will then make their plans according to his purpose. Mm -hmm. So before I make plans, I go and spend time with God's mind. What, what is your purpose? What are you thinking? I always wonder why God says, I love King David. He's a man after my own heart. I always wondered why. Then you read the book of Psalms, and especially the Psalms that David wrote, and you begin to understand. David was always thinking about God's mind, not his hands. Mm. Who is man that you are mindful of him? Yeah. Oh Lord, how majestic is your name. Blessed always. And God says, I like this guy. Because religious people seek God's hands and Christ wasn't happy with them. But people who are Christ followers, who are serious about God, they're not interested in God's hands. They want God's mind. Yeah. Because if you can understand God's mind, you can then interpret his hands very clearly. That's why I think the most important book in scripture, one of them is Ephesians. Because it just deals with God's mind. Mm. It's just telling you how God thinks and what God was thinking and what God's purpose was. So we have to get away from the habit of wanting to see the physical works of God only and try to understand why God works the way he works. Yeah. And that is a frustrating journey Yeah. because God is too deep. Yeah. And I've been on that journey for um, 15 years. Every day I try to think. How does God think? I only care about God's mind. Yeah. And then you see miracles and you see things happening. But when we limit ourselves just to God's miracles, and even now in a pandemic and what's going on, we need God's miracle. Mm -hmm. We do. Yep. But it's more important to understand God's mind. Yeah. It's more important. Yeah. And how do we understand God's mind? What do we know about God's mind? Well, it's very clear. God sent his mind to earth mm -hmm. and he trapped his mind inside a body and called it Jesus. Mm -hmm. So if you want to know what God is thinking, study what Jesus did. Yeah, It's as simple as that. And Jesus came to earth to completely shift culture. For example, he wanted to make earth look like heaven. So he would walk and see a blind man. And he said, well, there's no blindness in heaven. So see, he'd walk and see people hungry and well, there's no poverty and hunger in heaven. So, hey, give me five pieces of bread and more, feed them. Yeah. He always, miracles are simply confirmation of heaven's culture. And during a pandemic, we need heaven's culture. Yeah. Of peace, of love, of joy, of grace, of forgiveness, of all these things. That's what the world needs right now, of power, of overcoming. That's what we need yeah. right now. That's right. And we're going to get it once we understand God's mind. Yeah. Which is very difficult to do. Yeah. But that's the challenge. That's so good. That's, the that's so good. So we have to spend time with the Lord. Mm -hmm. We have to study his word to understand his mind. His yeah. thoughts. I, and and that's, um, that's an encouragement, I would say a challenge that I'd like to put out there. Yeah. Um, I personally am doing that. I mean, I'm, I'm saying we're all in the same boat, right? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Which I... Part of me loves that. We don't yeah. have gurus out there no. saying, hey, we've been here before. Let's, <laughs> no. uh, let, me, let me show you how to navigate yeah. this time. No. 
um, everybody's in the same place um, and, and are being humbled right now. And so to understand the mind of God is to spend time with him, to study him, to look at yeah, um, exactly. what he's doing, to look at Jesus as you're saying right yeah. now, and then to, to be Christ-like on earth as it is in heaven. Um, because if you're going to see miracles happen, if you're going to be the solution right now, then you've got to have the mind of Christ yeah. and the kingdom perspective. Yes. So that's our challenge yeah. as a church. That's our challenge as a church. And though as I was going to say the one great thing about God, there's many great things about God. Um, this great thing about God um, and in the flesh, Jesus was many times the disciples would ask him questions and he actually would answer them. Mm -hmm. like it wasn't like he wasn't sometimes we make spiritual matters and the Christian walk spooky and mysterious and Christ was very practical yeah he was very just here's what you need to do um, they asked him hey John taught his disciples how to pray when are you gonna teach us how to pray he, did, he never dismissed their request yeah he said if you want to pray here's how and he taught him how to pray and I think what we now know as the Lord's Prayer um, is gonna be our key is going to be our key to get mm. out of this. Um, our Father, who art in heaven, there it is again, making sure you locate him. He's yeah. not here, not from earth. So our solution could be elsewhere. That's the key. You have to tie your solution not to earth, to heaven. Yeah, come on. Who is in heaven. Holy is your name. This is the key part. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That, for me, is the only thing we need right now because what's happening right now on earth looks nothing like heaven. And Christ is saying, your solution is to not take earth to heaven, but bring heaven to earth. Yeah. Can we bring God's will, God's mind, God's purpose, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven? Yeah. That's the key. I was born in the Congo, where we once were ruled by the kingdom of Belgium. And so I speak French. And I learned Belgian history in school. I knew all about Belgian chocolates. I knew all about Belgian culture. Mm. I knew about the Belgian um, sports stars and celebrities because that was the curriculum given to Congolese kids. It was what the kingdom did. So everything happened in the Congo reflected what happened in the kingdom of Belgium. Yeah. Because Belgium was ruled in the Congo. So when Christ uses words like kingdom, that's the concept. It's yep. the idea of whatever's happening there needs to be happening here. Yeah. So we have to ask ourselves, is there stress and, and panic and and anxiousness over what's happening in heaven no hmm. there is on earth so until earth looks like heaven we have a lot to pray for yeah we only stop praying when that's fulfilled thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven and you look at earth okay that it's not like heaven yet so we keep praying we keep trying to drag heaven into the now and god has chosen to do this through what he calls his church yep and so that's where the church has to stand and then after you've done standing, stand some more and to make sure you can bring um, heaven's culture, which is such a wonderful culture. Come it's on. peace, it's healing, it's, it, it's joy, it's, it's love, it's fellowship. Can we get that on earth in the middle of a pandemic? Yeah. That's what God is trying to do. That is so good. That is yeah. so good. I, um, I've been trying so hard um, with my attitude. Mm -hmm. I'll just be honest, Steve, like... <laughs> I'll have some good days and I'll have some bad days. <coughs> Me too. And I'll have some bad, I'll, I'll, all of a sudden I'll be in a bad attitude. Yeah. And I'll just, uh, you know, something on, you know, the news yeah. or a conversation and my attitude, you know, um, has, has yeah. gone south. Um, but the deception that I'm finding is that I feel, I can feel justified mm. in my attitude, in my bad attitude. Yeah. Well, I feel justified in this. Um, but bringing heaven to earth. Yeah. Does my attitude reflect heaven. what's happening in heaven right now? Culture. Yeah. Absolutely not. Yeah. And so um, praying for that peace and praying to be that conduit of the kingdom of God. Yeah. And I'd love to, I'd love to conclude on that because mm -hmm. I, I feel like what a word to, to be in prayer and to get proactive, to contend for yeah. the attitude, the values and the culture of the kingdom of God yeah. here on earth as it is in heaven. And uh, Steve, I just want to thank you so much. Like, oh, I, thank you. I, uh, I want to go through each point that you did. And just, <laughs> and I don't have my notepad out here, but I'm, I'm going to watch this later and, and, and put down notes. But um, in conclusion, 
Could you pray for us? Yeah. Um, just pray for our church, the, the things that have been in part. We want to receive that. I uh, really believe this is a word from the Lord, a, a word out of God's word um, that we can really receive. And so just in conclusion, if you yeah. would, uh, would be so so kind to, to pray for us and yeah. you know we'll we'll close and and take churches want to say let's uh let's let the seed of the word um grow and let's not just be hearers of the word let's be let's be doers of, uh, yeah. of the word and uh thank you to, to steve again yes father first of all i thank you i thank you for what you've put in my mind to come here and share the words of faith vision and innovation let those words land on good ground yeah amen. let them land in our hearts and take root lord lord we know it's a difficult time for all of us we're all in this but we have a hope in heaven yeah come teach on. us to look not at our circumstances but to look to you for our solutions then give us the wisdom that we need your wisdom your mind on how we should navigate these circumstances. Give us a spirit of innovation where we are mm. okay understanding that what worked no longer works. It's okay to change. The anointing is on us, not on the method. Come Give on. us the faith Come to on. believe that. Yeah. Lord, I pray for this church specifically, Lord. What a wonderful body, a wonderful light. Let this be the city that is set on a hill where the people in this town, they look to this city, to, to, to this church to see what they should do. Hmm. Let answers emerge from this building. Let solutions emerge from this building. Let world changes emerge yeah, from this building. People that carry your spirit, carry your values, carry your culture. Let them influence the world systems. Lord, we need you now more than ever. You know we cannot do it alone. Hmm. So like David, we say, what is man that you are mindful of him? We know your mind is full of us, Lord. So today we rest in the knowledge that you spent every second thinking about us. And we trust that our help comes from heaven. And I declare that my church shall be filled with the spirit of God, the solutions of God, the culture of God, and be a place that operates in faith, vision, and innovation. In Jesus' name we declare, amen. 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 Thank you, brother. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That was awesome. <laughs>